Welcome to the second episode of the Carolyn Glick Show with my friend and co-host, Gadi Taub. Hi, Gadi. Hi from Tel Aviv. Hi from Efrat in the hills of Judea. Anyway, uh, <laughs> now, that, now that we've gotten the geographical notes aside, um, well, we had, uh, we're having some uh, pretty dramatic events this week, and I thought we might talk about them. Uh, we had uh, earlier this week on uh, Monday night uh, drama at the Knesset and the U.S. and some of the Israeli press were quick to say this was uh, Netanyahu's last uh, last uh, gasp of air and he was on his way out. Uh, and I think we're going to have to talk about that a bit and, and discuss what's going on really in Israel's arcane world of politics. And then from there, I think we'll move on to uh, what's happening in Israel-U.S. relations and, and take a really close look at what's going on at the J Street conference uh, that's going on now virtually in Washington and uh, what it bodes for the future of American and Israeli relations, certainly under the Biden administration and perhaps more generally, it's hard to know at this point and uh, or maybe we will know at the end of our conversation. And then the third thing that uh, we'll talk about is uh, some pretty startling uh, statements uh, over the past several days by Linda Thomas-Greenfield, the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations and uh, about her own country uh, and uh, what that also tells us about uh, anti-Americanism, anti-Israelism and everything in between. So um, without further ado, uh, let's start with uh, Israel's political morass. Yeah, good luck explaining this to a foreigner, Caroline. Yeah, good luck explaining it to a foreigner. You know, this is something that Israelis are hard pressed to understand. So I think that I was on the phone yesterday with like f five people who were there to try and explain what exactly was it. But yeah, you had a you had a good handle on it. Yeah, no, look, I, I don't have a, I don't I don't have a great handle on it. I'm not sure that even the participants, as you said, really have a great handle on it. But just uh, sort of uh, 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 standing on one leg, let's try to explain and let's try to explain to foreigners. So Israel has a parliamentary democracy, which means that you have to form a majority coalition in our parliament, the Knesset, in order to form a government. There are 120 members of the Knesset, and so you need 61 uh, uh, people on your side in order to form a coalition. Uh, we've had four elections now over the past two years, and in every single one of them, Netanyahu has come between six and one vote short of a 61-seat uh, governing majority. And as a result, we keep going to new elections because the other side never was able to come up with uh, 61 or 60 plus uh, members of the of the Knesset to vote for an alternative to Netanyahu. So we've been in this impasse where no side, not Netanyahu and the head of the right wing bloc of parties, nor his electoral opponents uh, have the requisite 61 seats in order to form a stable coalition government. Um, and, and that is despite the fact that we have a clear right wing majority. The problem is that we, we now have we, we now have three right wing parties who are boycotting the, the, the head of the right, boycotting the prime minister of the right wing bloc. Right, exactly. So that's the newest thing. I mean, people look at all kinds of things in Israel and try to understand. And I think that the main thing that we have to understand is exactly the rise of these disgruntled right wingers who have small parties with between, you know, six and seven members of Knesset this time uh, out of 120. Again, the liquid is 30, just for people to get a sense of proportions uh, that uh, receive those seats from right wing voters. And, uh, and now, particularly two of them that together have 13 seats, uh, they are refusing to join a right-wing-led government and in fact are, are making it very clear that they'd rather form a partnership with the left. And here I think is where people from outside of Israel, particularly in the United States, can sort of latch on to what's going on here because uh, these people uh, bear a striking similarity, in, including in their political advisors and, and to a degree their funders, with a uh, with with the most surprising phenomenon in American uh, and the decisive uh, uh, factor in American politics uh, in 2020, which is the Never Trump Republicans. These are very much the Israeli version of them. They're the Never Bibi, Never Netanyahu uh, right wingers in Israel. So why don't you sort of explain? who they are and, and uh, what motivates them and anything else you think is important for our, our viewers to understand about them. Yeah, it's, there, is, there, there are similarities and yet there are also 
very important differences. Um, the similarities, I think, is you know that I, I tend to uh, divide the political map according to the ideological lines that that populists do between between uh, globalists and and patriots, and we have our version of that. And the left here is increasingly progressive and pro uh, illegal immigration and all the rest of it. And also, this belongs to an elite which would rather rule through the courts than through the parliament. So we are seeing, I think, on the left, sociologically speaking, the same phenomenon that is parallel to the globalist Republicans who cannot stand Trump for ideological reasons. That's the, that, that, that part is really similar. Now there's the other part of personal hatred. And I think that here... That, that here it's confusing to say that never Trumpers are never Bibis, although never Bibi was the Bibi or not Bibi, it's like a Shakespearean take on, 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 a, on politics here because this is all anyone talked about. We have Iran, we have uh, uh, COVID-19, we have economic problems, we have every, every, all anyone said anything about was Bibi or not Bibi. But the personal is not the same because Bibi, unlike Trump, Bibi doesn't have a brash style. He's not that flamboyant. He's actually what we call mamlachti. How would you translate that? That's a horrible word to translate. He's, he's just, he's, he's not, he's not an outsider. He's an insider. He's also very conservative. He's much more conservative than yeah. populist. I think that the populism is something that, that he's embraced over time. But you know, I mean, you see it very clearly in, in his very different view of, of COVID-19 when it first started from uh, Trump's. You know, he's very cautious. And uh, and um, and so I think, you know, his his view of the world is very different. I think also, you know, Trump is sort of uh, a flash in the pan. A lot of people saw him as, you know, he was a Johnny come lately. He he only he, the first time he ever ran for for elected office was when he ran for the presidency in 2016. And Netanyahu. This is going to be, uh, I think, his fifth or sixth term in office. He's the longest serving Israeli prime minister. And I think one of the sources of hatred uh, towards him, I mean, there, I think there are two. One is that he stymies the personal ambition of a lot of these much younger politicians who come, you know, more from our generation of uh, people who came of age in the, in the 70s or the 80s, and he came of age in, in the early 60s. So I think... You know, there's a generational shift that they're saying, you know, we want to move forward and you're blocking our path and we have to get you out of the road. And the other so, thing is that, you know, since he was first elected prime minister in 1996, and even before that, when he was elected head of the Likud, uh, I think in 1993, um, he, the, the left has over time coalesced around an obsessive hatred of Netanyahu, because what Netanyahu has offered Israelis even uh, much more uh, significantly than Menachem Begin, the first Likud prime minister, did in the 1970s, is a completely different way of looking at governance and government and the role of government in people's lives and also what Israel's actual potential is and what it can become. And he's really moved Israel from you know, a, a, a socialist economy into a free market economy. He's enabled a massive amount of economic growth in this country through his economic policies. He's completely reordered Israel's strategic posture by changing the whole uh, the whole bent of our of our discourse and our actual uh, policies in terms of of our regional affairs and in terms of global affairs. You know, the, before Netanyahu, the concept was that Israel is a is a dependent state, we're dependent on the United States, and basically our foreign policy is whatever the United States tells us to do from time to time. I mean, there were obvious differences between the various parties about that, and what was important here, uh, particularly in relation to uh, Judea and Samaria, and to our and to our, our sovereign claims to to these areas and to Jerusalem and so on and so forth, but Israel, our our focus from a foreign policy perspective was always on cultivating and maintaining our relations with the United States and viewing our ability to develop bilateral ties with other countries as contingent on the strength of our relations with the United States and what and here and and here Netanyahu sh share. Uh, actually went against the consensus of the elites of Israel and the United States because he was saying for a long time that we that we shouldn't let have let the Palestinians have a veto and we should start building peace from 
the periphery with with other countries that we have common interests with and actually his clash with the United States was instrumental in bringing what uh, Trump uh, later enabled in the Abraham Accords because because Netanyahu said and this is a very bold thing to, when he came to the houses of congress he said and he said this again on on the Holocaust Memorial Day that we would not uh, we would not see ourselves bound by any agreement that would enable Iran to have to have a, a a nuclear bomb and 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 when he did that it it scared Israelis a, a great deal um but but it turns out he was right because he showed Obama too what the limits of pressure on Israel can be and I think that he's doing it now I'll be very sad if it stopped because Biden is moving back to to the um to the to the nuclear agreement with Iran, and what the what Netanyahu does, if according to foreign uh, sources, it, it it is us doing all this, is showing them that we would not bow down. But I had one, just to finish the point, I started making with one more thing. You said it, uh, Netanyahu is is a professional politician and has been going through the ranks for many years. The system in Israel is such that unlike failed. Um, failed uh, presidential candidates in America, nobody goes away. They all stay in circulation. And Netanyahu is very Machiavellian. And, and, at, uh, and this is, I think, his, a strategic mistake that he has made over the years. At every specific juncture, he thinks that those who are loyal to him, the, those who are closest to him, do not need to be rewarded because they would stay loyal to him. And so he rewards the second tier and those he needs to flatter and buy. And so people like Saar and Bennett, I think they're both reckless. I think they're both obsessed with personal ambition and personal hatred. But nevertheless, they have been stepped on and they have a personal grudge against Netanyahu. And these people don't go away. Um, unless they get completely knocked out by their own constituency, which is really hard. I think you're right. I think that, you know, the, the more, uh, the longer that you stay in politics, particularly per particularly if your style really is always to look at people as instrumental and to keep your friends close and your enemies closer, or even to just completely neglect your friends and only reward your enemies because you need them, um, the longer that you stay in politics, the more people are going to be frustrated and angry with you. And I think that part of that is what we're seeing here. But I think, you know, um, just because you started the discussion about what Netanyahu did, I think it's very important to highlight the Palestinian veto issue, because that's going to, we're also going to be getting that in the next, you know, part of our, uh, the next segment in this broadcast, which is just that um, it, over time, the idea that uh, establishing a Palestinian state was the be-all and end-all of American foreign policy in the Middle East, and that this was sort of the, the centerpiece of America's strategic goals, and if you could get this right, then everything else would fall in line, has, uh, um, has made, has, has sort of brought in, has, has completely destabilized America's ties with Israel, because you see that the United States actually has a strategic goal that A, doesn't make any sense from an American perspective, but that's their problem. It endangers Israel because there is no deal to be had with the Palestinian Authority, with the PLO, that won't uh, pose an existential threat to Israel, to its very existence. And so the more tied up the United States became with this paradigm that there is no way of moving forward on anything in the Middle East uh, so long as you don't have the establishment of a Palestinian what, state and what's called the two-state solution, uh, the more hostile even pro-Israel presidents became. So, for instance, on the face of it, both Bill Clinton and George Bush, George W. Bush, were fairly friendly towards Israel. Uh, Bill Clinton was very friendly towards Yitzhak Rabin, and I don't think that he was at all anti-Semitic and that he had really any sort of animosity towards Israel as it was, but the minute that he took on this paradigm that a Palestinian state is the two-state solution is the way to go, and that everything else in the Middle East, Iran, Iraq, uh, Syria, Lebanon, everything would fall into place if you could just get this right. I mean, it's absurd, but this has been the paradigm of American foreign policy thinking for, for over a generation. 
the the more his his policies themselves necessarily became anti-Israel. So when we had Palestinian suicide bombings in the 1990s for the first time, uh, Bill Clinton said, "Well, they have to make a 100 percent uh, effort." But he didn't say that they had to stop it. They said he said no more. He, they have to make 100 percent effort to block suicide bombings. But this means nothing because then Arafat would say, well, we're doing our best and there, then you know, we would have another suicide bomb. So that the American, uh, the American commitment to that necessitated a, a, a rise of hostility towards Israel and a parting of the ways in terms of strategic goal of both countries. And what, what Trump did that really distinguished himself from everybody else is that he sort of took a sledgehammer to that kind of thinking and he said, Look, we don't want a huge footprint in the Middle East. What's going on now doesn't make any sense. The Palestinians are not the central issue in the Middle East. It's not what you know winds everybody's clock uh, in the morning or in the evening. They don't really care. What they care about is their own survival. They they don't look at Israel as a force of instability, but rather as stability. Uh, let's just make friends. So that he actually was the first U.S. president who latched on to Netanyahu's concept, which again was that the Palestinians aren't the center, we shouldn't be thinking about this, we should be thinking about what we have to offer other countries, whether it's Egypt or Jordan, or you know the, the Persian Gulf states, or South Africa, I mean South, South American states, African states, whatever it happens to be, let's develop bilateral ties based on common interests as opposed and, to and these and ideological ironically. goals. Ironically, also we had such a good laugh at John Kerry, right? Everybody played that clip where he where he said, "If you think there will be peace with any Arab state before peace with the Palestinians, no, 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 and no," with his eternal serious droop, and everybody, and 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 this is what they did, and and it turned out to uh, to all of us that, that the Arabs were sick of this. The Arabs were sick of the Palestinian recalcitrants because they've been paying for this in in part, but. Ironically, Obama was instrumental in this because it, when when he moved to to what is essentially a partnership with Iran, which is a terrorist state and a Nazi state, right? it's the closest closest to Nazi racism that, that we have known in an actual state. There are there are movements like that, but not in a state. When he moved closer to them, it scared the whole region, um, and certainly the Arabs, the Iranian are Farsis, uh, among other peoples, but uh, and not Arabs, and this suddenly showed to the Sunni states that the real interest of all peace-seeking states in this region is to control Iranian aggression, which threatens everyone, and the Palestinians are standing in the way. And now we've got the Biden administration, all the same people moving on, and it's like someone that I read called it the peace process industry. It's like the, it's like a whole bureaucracy that the 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 never ending peace process with the Palestinian is just their way of making a living of of being something in Washington, and and all this thing moved back. There's also I'll make a a, a short uh, a short comment about that in in the current atmosphere where all these people grew up on an Edward Said paradigm in their college studies. We are like the last lab in which you can juxtapose. Western guilt with actual military rule um, over another people, and we've been we've been giving him greater and greater autonomy, and what uh, and we can't get out of there. We can't get out of there as long as they threatened our our very existence with terrorism. Well, although I don't we, think we can get we, out of there we, at all. Although we try. I, I don't I, think I, we... before 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 the uh, the ideological goal I, it's not even a possibility for us this is why i i moved closer to your uh, position over the years right i was a, i was an oslo supporter but but this has gone out the window but th but it's easy for so many people now to to to, to replay the, their own uh, little school play of, 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 of pseudo-colonialism and, and juxtapose it on Israel and blame nationalism, which is for liberals now the bogeyman, on everything. So we have like a little doll theater for them to play the big drama that they were once in of colonialism now in our little corner of the world. I think you're right, and I just want to sort of round out the conversation because of, about our coalition, because, you know, yep. what we've had is, you know, Israel's position over the past decade since, uh, since Netanyahu came back into office in 2010 uh, has really been transformed. I mean, when you look at where we were in 2009, 
uh, under Ehud Olmert. You know, we had a terrible war in Lebanon, which, by the way, the Americans didn't even support us in. Like, they started out supporting us, and then they saw how incompetent our, our left-wing government's leadership was, uh, that Condoleezza Rice sort of started uh, making completely different positions than she had in the past, and she was running uh, the Bush administration's entire policy here, where she was legitimizing Hezbollah. You saw it reflected in the ceasefire agreement at the end of that war, uh, UN, UN Security Council Resolution 1701, where essentially it, it, it put Israel on the same moral plane as Iran's foreign legion in Lebanon, and that really paved the way for Hezbollah's takeover of the Lebanese government in 2008. And so, and, and then you had Hamas had taken over Gaza. They took over Gaza uh, in, uh, in, um, in, in 2000 and in 2007. And there was an election in, in 2006 right. and 2007. Right, and then there was the coup that, that, they, that they carried out in June of 2007. So you had, you, you had a situation that was unprecedented, you know, where you have two terrorist regimes that are on Israel's doorstep, uh, sponsored by Iran, both of them, and uh, we had a government that was completely incapable of handling any of this. And Netanyahu took this and the Americans didn't trust us. And obviously, you know, and actually what was interesting about the, the Second Lebanon War is that the Sunnis, again, wanted Israel to win because they're terrified of Iran, they're terrified of Hezbollah, so that you saw this kind of, you know, almost um, behind the scenes support for Israel against Hezbollah already in 2006. And people were really rooting for us. And then we failed to deliver the goods because we had such an incompetent government. And that was strategically blind and all of the rest of it. And Netanyahu has completely changed the situation, right? Now, the same Sunni governments who wanted us to beat Hezbollah, and we failed to do so in 2006, look at Israel as the winner, that they can, they can bet on this horse with everything in relation to Iran and uh, in regional affairs more generally. Israel has become a regional, a regional power uh, in its own right because of sort of a deft... Uh, diplomacy mixed with a very active tempo of operations against Iran inside of Iran, its nuclear sites, its nuclear scientists. There was a big New York Times article about it uh, that came out today. Uh, it's just about the success of the strategy inside of Iran, but also in Syria and uh, in Gaza. That's very careful not to commit to a major war, but at the same time, very careful to massively deter our enemies by keeping them unbalanced all the time and denying them the ability to really, you know, transform Syria into another uh, Ye Yemen in terms of its strategic capabilities and so on and so forth. So uh, we've become, because of his deft statementship, uh, a regional power. And now what we're looking at, you know, if if he's taken down by this coalition of the left and never Netanyahu right-wing parties that are going to block him from forming a coalition and may do a lot of other things uh, as well to oust him from power is that we'll have a much weaker government um, under all circumstances if Netanyahu is, is ousted from power. And uh, if it's a left-wing government or left-dominated government, which in all likelihood is probably what would happen, um, we may find ourselves in a very, very bad strategic position and everything that Netanyahu has built up uh, may be squandered, or you know, we may find ourselves very quickly in a war uh, or other sort of uh, confrontation with with our enemies uh, that are that are new, inexperienced leaders with uh, either vague ideology or or wrong ideology, or just simply interested in their own personal gain, will be ill equipped and, and, and to, to lead us through. And weakness. It takes. If we need, if if we need to to, to have a serious uh, confrontation with America, we, without breaking the relationship, no one is talking about that. But uh, you you were speaking about the wars with with Hamas in 2014. Kerry and Obama tried to bend our hand to a Turkey brokered Muslim Brotherhood agreement, which would mean bowing down to Hamas. And Netanyahu very deftly just bypassed them through Egypt. Again, a Sunni country that has similar interests to ours and has just gotten over the Muslim Brotherhood in their in their own country. And openly sided with Israel so that he was able to do something that nobody thought was going to be done, which is essentially build in the middle of war an operational alliance with the Sunnis that got caught the Americans completely unawares and they were and they were left flat footed and that was the reason why, you know, in Israel people don't understand 
Um, and you know, and I've explained this uh, repeatedly in my articles and and in speeches and everything. But is but the media here, which is the one sort of factor that we didn't talk about, is is so di- it distorts reality to such a degree. I mean, it's very similar to CNN uh, in terms of you know what they highlight, what they hide, how they present events to make it impossible for Israelis to really understand unless they're getting independent information. Uh, what's going on? But the the Israeli media sort of presented what happened in 2014 in the war with Hamas as a total defeat and a completely wasted opportunity, and Israel screwed everything up and everything like that. And Netanyahu was a failure because they didn't understand that what was actually happening was that he was fighting a war. He in the middle of war built a new alliance system for Israel in 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 sort of rebellion against the Obama administration. And he saved us from uh, from falling it to our knees before Hamas, Turkey, and Qatar, which were sort of opposing us on the other side. So you know this was this was the thing that you know people don't understand, and this is something you know that we're likely to lose if the never be uh, right wingers uh, move forward with their plans, and that's really what we're faced with right now. And, and at this point, you know, the best option for Israel may be to just go to a fifth election, although I don't know how repeating the same practice over and over. But why don't we move on to the second issue that we wanted to talk about, since we already, like, I don't know if you guys heard, but there was a timer, and we passed that by. Whew, we flew by that while ago. Oh, that was the timer. I thought you just for- forgot to turn, up, to turn off your ringer. No, ah, it was it was cool. the timer. I should probably also take my French fries out of the oven, but you know, we'll worry about that later. <laughs> yeah, we're going to bring your kitchen timer, right? No, we'll we'll <laughs> we'll, we'll turn those we'll turn those uh, uh, oven oven French fries into uh, potato chips, you know, because they'll be burned to a cinder. But that's okay. My kids are used to it. <laughs> anyway, let's let's talk a second about uh, what's happening with American and Israeli relations, and if you don't mind, I'd like to start with. Old Liz Warren, you know, with her post during the, I mean, whatever, anyway, her, her, her perfect uh, uh, left-wing intellectual haircut and jewelry. Eh? You're not going to say Pocahontas? What's that? You're not going to say Pocahontas? Oh, yeah, why don't we call her Pocahontas? She's one uh, third. We need someone like Trump here. We need someone like Trump here to give nicknames. We're really, we miss, really we bad in Trump. Israel. <laughs> I miss Trump. But by the way, you know, he gave this interview to Sean Hannity last night, and I watched... On YouTube, I watched about, I don't know, uh, maybe two-thirds of it. So I saw on television, I think this morning, they gave a five-second clip of it. And it made it sound like Trump was uh, defending Russia. He said, I think it's really important to have good relations with with Putin. And I don't see how this harms America's interests. But... Uh, so that sounds like, oh, see, he's showing that he is a, a Russian resume. collusion. Yeah, finally, we found proof for Russian collusion. Right, it, except that interview. what they did was they took it totally out of context, right? Because he was saying the whole time that they blocked the United States from having relations that could have been beneficial to the United States with Russia through the whole Russia collusion thing. And by the way, that would have had profoundly positive implications for Israel and for the fight against Iran and its nuclear uh, uh, program. If there had, if if Trump's plan of of really working with Russia on Iran against Iran had been pushed forward, I I always thought that the Russia collusion thing was actually just a transposition. Uh, it was a way of hiding the fact that what they really were protecting is that they were willing to have a confrontation with Russia in order to protect Iran, and I still believe that that's the case. And anyway, I I want to read because I think it's important. Uh, you know, while we speak, the, the J Street, uh, the anti-Israel Jewish-led organization in Washington is having their annual conference. And yesterday, uh, Liz Warren, Pocahontas, uh, gave a speech, which was, I think it was important because she's important. She's important because she's a very influential senator. She's uh, one of the lead representatives of the progressives in the Democratic Party, and they're the dominant faction in the party. In fact, they're the only faction in the party. I mean, there are other factions in the party, but the only one with a say anymore are the progressives, and, and Elizabeth Warren is, is one of the leads, uh, uh, leaders of that, uh, of that faction. So she gave a speech at J Street yesterday that was uh, profoundly, profoundly hostile to Israel, profoundly hostile to U.S.'s relations, and she did it in the same passive-aggressive way that uh, we've seen from progressive leaders in the United States over the past decade or so, which is that they say they wrap up their 
their hatred, their hostility towards Israel with love. They talk about tough love. They talk about the need to tell the truth, hard truths to to one another. And and these were you know uh, phrases that Obama coined. Uh, and that J Street is popularized and enabled and, and served as a Jewish fig leaf to, to propound and proliferate among progressive circles. And then the actual meat and bones of her speech were exceedingly uh, anti-Israel. You know, she, she opposes having the embassy in Jerusalem. And if, if there's already one, then, you know, they should have done something parallel with the Palestinians. Um, and she want, and we'll get into it a little bit more. She wants to condition U.S. military aid to Israel on, on non-use in Judea and Samaria and Gaza, which is saying, you know, uh, we're going to try to treat you like we're treating the Saudis. We look at you the way that we look at the Saudis, and we're, we want Iran's proxy, the Houthis in Yemen, to win in the war against Saudi Arabia. It doesn't matter to us that the Houthis are, are starving the Yemenites, the Yemeni people, uh, on behalf of Iran, and then blaming it on Saudi Arabia. That doesn't matter to us. Uh, we like Iran, we want to empower Iran, we want to empower Iran's proxies. Hamas is an Iranian proxy. Uh, we want to empower them against Israel, and we're not going to sell you hellfire missiles. Uh, we're not going to do all kinds of other things to you, the way that Obama also placed an informal arms embargo on Israel in the middle of that 2014 war. Um, and we want to do that to Israel and say that we love Israel and that we're really for Israeli security. But she said something else that was unprecedented. She called for the overthrow of Netanyahu. And I'd, I'd really like to share with our viewers precisely what she said, because I think, you know, why don't, why don't I do that? And then you tell me what you think of what she said. That's amazing, yeah. Okay, so she, she said this, Israel's long-term strategic interests have been serve, ser, served poorly by its longest serving prime minister. So she's telling us what our strategic interests are, and she's saying that they've been poorly served by the longest serving prime minister, never mentioning that he was elected democratically. He has precipitated four stale, he has precipitated, it's his fault, four stalemate elections in two years in his frenzied effort to immunize himself from well-documented charges of corruption. She, he's guilty. Liz Warren is telling the American people that, that Bibi is a crook and all that he's doing, he's doing in order to get out of, of his legal problems, and he has to go. Netanyahu does not command a majority of the new Knesset, but Israel's president told him to try anyway, lamenting that the law does not allow him to do anything else while Netanyahu is currently on trial. In other words, he doesn't have the legal power to oust him. Too bad. Then she says, if Netanyahu fails in this task, the majority that opposes him must decide what to do next. Will they continue to fight amongst themselves and in the process prop up a corrupt leader who puts his own interests ahead of his country? Or will they join together to begin the difficult task of rooting out corruption and reinstating the rule of law? There's no rule of law in Israel. It has to be reinstated, according to Liz Warren. This is the same fork in the road that the U.S. faced in the election of 2020, despite our differences. A significant majority of Americans concluded that the integrity of a democracy is far more important than the personal interests of one leader and banded together to defeat Donald Trump. Israel's elected leaders should do the same and give the Israeli people a new prime minister. So essentially what she's saying is you guys um, have to use parliamentary trickery in order to do what the people haven't done, which is oust your prime minister from power. And she's literally doing something that is unprecedented in American history. She is calling for the ouster through non-election. But first of all, she's openly calling for the ouster of a, of a democratic country that is allied with the United States. This has never, ever happened. And then afterwards, she goes through what I started you know, describe <coughs> this long list of things that Israel has to be punished for and a long list of U.S. policies that she wants the, the Biden administration to take, all of which are going to be hostile acts, hostile actions against Israel on behalf of the Palestinians. And this is so striking how, how the, uh, the, the, the map of Israel is read by American um, gestalt. It's like, it, the, I, if, I, if I understand correctly what is going on here, she has been getting some briefs of the uh, left-wing Israeli press uh, 
which is, this is exactly the song they are singing, it struck her as very familiar because this is the whole rhetoric. They said Trump was guilty of Russian collusion before there was proof. They said that taking him down by the FBI is actually protecting democracy. The whole shebang. And, and also she joins this with, with, with the with the idea that the, the, the leader here and there is acting against the interest of the country. So it's a left-wing Ben Rod style narrative weaving that is completely ideological. It's only ideology. There is nothing here in terms of what she knows about the Netanyahu trial, what she knows about the interest of the country, what she knows about procedure and, and what the what the president here what, what's the role of the president here which is just ceremonial and and she's confusing she's she's giving an american audience a song which basically said deja vu we've seen this now netanyahu is trump and the israelis must do what we did and we must take him down because he's a threat to national security yeah and she's and she's very much i mean if if you know in the last thing we were talking about the never Bibi right, you know, that is the Israeli counterpart to the never Trump Republicans. And again, the re never Trump Republicans won this battle for Biden by repressing, you know, a Republican vote and also by legitimizing um, Biden, even though it was it was self-evident to anybody paying attention that he was going to be the most radical president. He was surrounded by progressives. The progressives are the dominant wing of the Democrat Party. And it was very and, and it was self-evident, but they gave license to Republicans to vote sort of on their snobbishness, right? To say, well, you know, it, they, he turned they the never Trumpers turned it into a class issue. Or right, if you're for Trump, then you're a racist, then you're a nationalist, then you know you're a jingo, you're jingo, jingoistic, you know, xenophobe, and all of the rest of it. Um, and uh, if you're anti-Trump, then you're enlightened, then you're then you're for. Uh, you're good. Your your you know your your morals are better, and so on and so forth. And you can be part of the the elite. You can't be a member of the elite and be pro Trump. And here she's saying sort of you know along the same line. She's saying, um, you know, uh, all right thinking people have to band together. Wink wink, Gidon Saar. Wink wink, Naftali Bennett. All the people who understand what a danger Netanyahu is, how he's only serving himself how he's destroying Israel, they all have to band together to oust him from power, right? To give and the Israeli people a new prime minister. Oust him. And reinstate the, reinstate the rule of law. Right. Uh, but that, here, but the, the thing that's very important here is that the Israeli left, right, when, when they talk, when they try to personalize the issue and they make the elections just about Bibi, they do it because they can't win an ideology. So if it's all personalized about Netanyahu, it's much easier to convince a significant portion of the public to hate Netanyahu than it is to convince them that the left's plans for appeasement, for you know, restoring Israel's uh, uh, economic uh, system of so you know of socialism as the economic system for Israel, and and all the rest of it, and turning us into an open borders country that you know all Africans are welcome. So long as they vote for us, you know, along the lines of of the of the Democrats' uh, views of open borders with Mexico. Yeah, it, it, here, you you can't just vote if if you're if you're an immigrant. Um, but but what I think is also striking about this that at least a, a striking difference that at least in Israel we do know what Netanyahu's policies are. What the American the American press has become so corrupt, so deeply corrupt, that intelligent people don't even know what Trump's policies were. They they we, we have been uh, or I've been talking to some friends who told me no you don't understand. He does not have a policy. There is no policy. It's just he's just tweeting in the middle of the night and and, and deciding on the fly what he's gonna do tomorrow. Um and therefore they can't explain, for instance, the immense success of the Trump administration in the Middle East because they got something very right. And uh, you probably read this piece by, by Mike Duran, uh, who said he, he understands bullies. He understands that the only way to speak with bullies is carry a bigger stick. 
now we, we have an American administration who holds the philosophy that it should carry a toothpick and speak softly. And if you think that you can do anything with a toothpick and speaking softly in the Middle East, you are, and especially against the Farsis who can, you know, they can cheat an Obama while they sleep. They've been, do, they've been handling the Middle Eastern cheating dem uh, diplomacy for, for three millennia. And it's not even just that. I think that you know the thing with the with the uh, with 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 Biden is that it's the same as Obama. I mean, we know again. You know, there's some very strange debate in the United States over whether or and also here whether really Biden and 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 Trump and uh, I'm sorry and and Obama are the same. Of course they are. I mean, it's just that four years have passed and they want to go back. Now, it's not that they want to start where Obama started in 2009. They want to start where Obama left off in 2017. That's why they seem much more radical. It's just that they're not radical. We forgot where Obama left off. Obama left off with giving Iran an open road to the bomb, not with negotiating. It's he having already given it to them. He already gave it to them. And he tried to you know, uh, go around the Senate by uh, having the UN Security Council pass a resolution that was binding under, you know, the charter under Article Seven of the Charter to make it into an, an, a binding international agreement uh, that uh, that anchored the deal in American law, which uh, was really unconstitutional. But whatever. So, you know, they already did that. They already gave Iran the bomb in 2025, 2030, and that's where they want to be today. The same thing with the Palestinians. They already have shown that you know they want Israel out of the Jordan Valley, they want Jerusalem divided, uh, they think that the Palestinians uh, have the moral upper hand over Israel, they want Israel to be cut down to sides, they don't want Israel to have alliances with the Sunni governments, they want to support the Muslim Brotherhood, they don't want to support a uh, sort of status quo uh, Sunni governments. So I think you know, this is this that's, is where that's your they, timer again. Yeah, we're gonna. Well, but that's fine because we're we're moving on to the next thing very quickly. Look, I'm trying to be professional here. You know, I mean, you know, this it's is like very number professional two. to have a sound timer. Right, but I I don't know <laughs> how next to time use make my it cell just phone. Flash. I I don't know. I mean, you know, I thought that the phone volume was off, but it works out that I left it on. So I'm sorry, guys. Super. I'm good at pontificating, not so good at using technologies that I'm now using. So again, so sorry. But <laughs> just now, now I having completely uh, exposed all of my weaknesses. Let me just uh, let me just go back to 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 where it was, which was that um, you know we we have a problem where the United States under the Biden administration. We see this with Liz Warren. And, you know, the the left likes to say that Netanyahu has turned uh, being pro-Israel into a partisan issue. But exactly the opposite is the case when you have one of the most senior Democratic senators, Elizabeth Warren, uh, saying, and, and also you know Bernie Sanders saying much the same things, and certainly about conditioning aid, military assistance to Israel on uh, not its non-use in uh, our heartland in Judea and Samaria, and against a terror regime in Gaza. Um, you know, we're seeing that actually the partisanship isn't coming from Israel at all. It's coming from the left. It's coming from, from the Democrats that they're abandoning Israel because the, the, the policies that, that Liz Warren set out are all hostile to Israel. You know, their merits supports them. Merits is a, is a very small party in Israel. You know, they have five seats. They're sort of barely post Zionist as opposed to anti Zionist, meaning anti Semitic party. You know they're 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 willing uh, to pay lip service to certain national interests, but all of the policies that they advance, that they seek to advance in Israel, um, undermine Israeli sovereignty in a very profound way, in very various profound ways. Um, and those are all the policies that Liz Warren is saying have to be America's policies towards Israel. And I think here, you know, would be a bet. Uh, you want to add something before we move on to? Uh, no. The segue? No. All right. There no, won't no. be a... I, we won't put on a off timer. We go. Okay. So the off we go. So to the races, the third thing that we were going to talk about was American anti-Americanism. And there was, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, we see this with uh, with the wokenness, with the Black Lives Matter, um, 
movement that it, you know is, has laid waste to America's cities. You see it with Maxine Waters, you know, talking in the trial, uh, the Chauvin trial, uh, the policeman who's been uh, who's been, who's on trial for murder uh, in uh, in Minneapolis for for the death of um, George Floyd. George Floyd. Thank you. Um, and uh, calling for the protesters to really, you know. Uh, essentially set fire to the city if Chauvin is acquitted, which, you know, uh, the lawyers that I've spoken to about this say, you know, he didn't commit murder. He should never have been indicted for murder. If they had wanted to indict him for uh, negligent homicide, for involuntary homicide, for all other, you know, manslaughter, whatever, that you could have made a much stronger case. But he didn't commit murder. There was no premeditation, and, and it doesn't fit the statute. So, you know, a lot of lawyers from the outset, after he was indicted for murder, said that he has to be acquitted. There's no way that he, he committed it. So they're stuck now because they've indicted him for a crime that he clearly didn't commit. And so what they're trying to do is intimidate the jurors. Anyway, so we see this kind of a, attempt to undermine America. We see <clears throat> what's happening with all the cancel culture to freedom of speech in the United States and so on and so forth. But this week or last week, we saw uh, an extraordinary example of how the wokeness has become the order of the day in American foreign policy. When uh, Linda uh, Thomas Greenfield, America's ambassador to the United Nations, gave a speech to Al Sharpton's National Action Alliance, which is a very radical anti-police uh, you know, sort of corporate shakedown operation that he he founded, and of course Sharpton is an anti-Semite who, who incited the uh, Crown Heights uh, pogrom in right, 1992 yeah. that caused the death of a yeshiva student uh, from Chabad, uh, and named Rosenblum from from Melbourne, and uh, um, so um, Yankel Rosenblum. So, <clears throat> so this is he, she's speaking to an anti-Semite who supports, of course, Black Lives Matter, which is also an anti-Semitic organization. She's speaking to them, and she's discussing a speech that she gave at the UN uh, last month for the International uh, Day of Marking uh, the Fight Against Racism and, and, and Discrimination. I, I, I messed up the name, but whatever. But she said, and by the way, this is she said it at that speech also. She said, I have seen for myself how the original sin of slavery weaved white supremacy into our founding documents and principles. I wrote about this for my, my latest article in, in Newsweek because, you know, this is, a, this is a stunning statement by a U.N. ambassador from the U.S. I mean, the U.S. is, is second only to Israel in being isolated in the U.N. It's a, it's a, it's a notoriously anti-American organization that's dominated by tyrannies. And America can essentially get nothing through that it wants to because it has to have the support of, of tyrannical regimes that have no interest in supporting the United States because they're opposed to American power as a force for good in the world. But how, how far is this from the, from the Obama uh, Cairo speech? It's the exact same frame of mind where, where self-criticism has metastasized into self-hate and we are purifying ourselves by, by, by hating ourselves. And this is a frame of mind that I remember Kissinger remarking uh, how can an apology become the foreign policy of a superpower? And this is where ju you're just broadcasting weakness and this anti-Americanism. I don't. I'm. 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 I don't know if I should say this because I, somewhere in my head, I have. The, I said this to you already. I don't know if on this podcast or on some other show that I was an, on, an, 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 on a program studying American history in Rutgers University, and the only two people, you know the rest, the only two people who were willing to say anything good about America were me and a Japanese student. So this is a very telling thing. And I also listened to Obama's speech um, in the last uh, Democratic uh, Party convention. Um, and it was an amazing speech because, because you, because uh, identity politic is, politics is a balkanizing, um, uh, divisive ideology which creates uh, friction between minorities deliberately, and and he tried to and and he had a unifying vision and it was amazing. It was a masterpiece because he said, every one of us who came to these shores, were spat upon, humiliated, ostracized, and so. The, the binding uh, Jews, Italians, Irish people, you know, uh, Africans, of course. So the the binding uh, ethos, the the common experience, is one of oppression. And then even as this speech, and you ask, well, who is oppressing all these people? Who is the antagonist in this story of horror? America. 
These are people who actually hate America. The, 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 their picture of the world and this is why it enables the Iran policy because they, they don't care that Iran is actually racist that, is, that it's almost Nazi because in their worldview everything is our fault and this is a very rewarding kind of thing because now we can how, do you say self-flagellation or flagellation or we can, we, we can self-flagellate uh, and, and and thus become pure and then the diplomatic scene is just a stage on which we play this moral fable out of which we will emerge pure by hating America and right. it, is, it, it's a and, I mean look you know we talked a lot in Israel in the 1990s during the uh, during the the Oslo years when we had this uh, really crazy idea that if we empower the architect of modern terrorism uh, Yasser Arafat, we give him land, we give him legitimacy, we give him lots of money, we give him guns, guns. Israel gave guns to the PLO, and, the, and the, they're not going to use them against us. That this leopard has changed its spots, that there's no problem anymore, because the problem, the reason that they murdered our athletes at the Munich Olympics in 1972, the reason that they massacred ch ch school children in Ma'alot in 1974, and so on and so forth, the, the Hearn family in, in 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 uh, in Kiryat Shmona, I mean, you know, the list is so long. The, the the massacre at the Rome synagogue in 1982, where they killed a four-year-old boy. All of these things were Israel's fault. So if we change our ways, they're going to change their ways. This is an insane policy, completely uh, outrageously crazy. And I'm sorry that you supported it, but you know, I, I was I was in the army at the time, and I was on on Israel's negotiating team, and the absence of reality from the discussion was 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 palpable. You know, just let's concentrate on how we're gonna you know draft this article, whether it's a shall or will, and whether you know it's a affirmative remember, or negative. But remember also that the press convinced us, and they believed for a while that the Palestinian national movement is like the Jewish national movement, and that it seeks self-determination, not the destruction of Zionism. Right. So, so that based was on that. Yeah. That no, but see, that, not, was, that was Oslo turned insane. out to be a mistake, but. But but it, it it's not an impossibility. See, um, the thing is just... that there's a distinction between, and, and here's the difference, and, and here's what I, with the hope that I hold for the United States, although I have to say that it becomes dimmer and dimmer which e with each new report of wokeness on campus and indoctrination of, you know, five-year-olds to become transgendered. Um, but, you know, there was a large segment of the Israeli left that thought that that was convinced like you said by our media you know this is the reason why i became a, a writer is because of the way that the media distorted the reality of of the oslo years and and when i realized what a lie they were telling the public you know when i when i left the army and and i and i went to graduate school and came back you know i thought well i'll just write for a little while I worked out it became a profession but the idea you know behind it was gee you know let's try to get the the public to understand what's going on here uh, because we're being sold a batch of lies. But the thing is, is that, you know, the suicide bombings of the 1990s and then uh, the collapse of the Oslo process at Camp David when, you know, Arafat re rejected a Barak's offer of, of the Temple Mount, you know, of 90% of, of Judea and Samaria, of 100% of Gaza, the uh, partition of Jerusalem, uh, sovereignty over Judaism's uh, uh, holiest site, uh, and went to war against us, you know, that convinced a very large uh, segment of the Israeli left um, that this was this was a really bad idea. And then you saw the people who had not embraced Oslo and appeasement and and self-hatred as an article of faith, that they that they moved and, and we've really had the only leftists who have been able to get elected since 2000 have been leftists who pretend to be on the right or centrist, like, you know, Barack did it in 1999 and then Ehud Olmer did it in 2006. Um, and that's about it. And and the, the public doesn't want to have anything to do with them. Even now, when we have this hung parliament, you have 65 seats out of 120 that are clearly right wing votes and, and more if you add uh, uh, the the third uh, no BB party of Victor Lieberman is another seven, so that's you know seventy two seats. So you know we have a very large majority of Israelis who don't want to hear anything about the left. But then you have the the bitter the bitter uh, the bitter enders, you know the the people who will not leave because for them 
this is a this is a faith this is a religion so when linda uh, thomas green greenfield talks about the original sin of slavery this you know this is this is a transposition of a co-optation of of christianity and um and calling slavery first of all it's not true but calling slavery the original sin of the united states means that it, america has to be redeemed you know they whether it's a, a christ figure or, or something else. They need to purge themselves. They need to cleanse themselves. They need to change the way that they look at the world and accept the new Jesus, which is progressivism. So this is, you know, America has had a lot of religious revivals over its history, you know, different, different religious movements that have led to a lot of different changes in the United States. Um, and this is also, this is a, a, a post-God religious movement uh, that we've seen again, we see it in the the Israeli left as well, where their positions make no rational sense. But it's here, you know. I think it's more widespread. I think that they've worked much harder on building up the foundations of this faith, you know, across across public life in the United States, whether it's in Hollywood, whether it's in academia, in the bureaucracy, of course, and you know, just sort of across government and into into the world in 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 culture um and of course in the media and so it's i don't know i mean some of the things that they've been saying recently you know particularly about transgenderism i have to say but but really a lot of things are so off the wall crazy that it's hard for me to believe that people will like it which is why the cancel culture is so important because it's the emperor's new clothes nobody's allowed to say that the guy ain't wearing no clothes right so so you you have this weird situation where they come out with crazier and crazier things yeah let's bring you know let's give citizenship to 30 million people who we don't know who entered into this country illegally 10 million whatever you know insane numbers and everything will be fine and then we'll be and then we'll be pure i mean we saw this with gay marriage also and you know i'm not i'm not one way or another and then and it's either neither here nor there what i think of these issues but the idea was if you just agree with gay marriage then everything will be fine and then the next day uh, bruce jenner became a woman and and was given a cover on cosmopolitan and that launched the transgender there's always the next thing going on and if you don't like it then you're evil and then you go back to the original sin of slavery and you're a racist and you're bad and you have to purge yourself and you have to apologize abjectly and still be counseled because you said something you weren't allowed to say so i mean that's exactly, really exactly this is why i said it, it's been for for a while i've been saying that most of this identity politics is less vulgar marxism than a vulgar version of jesus christ it's the whole moral compass is just is just um, that 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 victimhood or basically being powerless is a moral uh, virtue, and this is and this is a very very bad compass to try and navigate by in the moral world because what it actually means is that whoever loses in any conflict was right. So if you end up <coughs> saying that that in a jail the jailer is always right and the criminal is wrong is the criminal is always right this is F michel foucault right in, in a sense um but but will you not be also then obliged to say that that nazi germany is the moral side because it lost because it was weak because it was occupied and we face the same thing the uh, uh, americans especially on the progressive left cannot wrap their heads around the idea that someone can be both weak and evil and the culprit in a conflict and and the palestinians have been playing on that they, they've been speaking the, the language of human rights in, in and, victimhood. They made and, a, victimhood. and victimhood and and the combination has enabled them to somehow say and they actually i look at them and s they say they actually formulated in this hypnotic way which they began to believe in that they, that it's a human right of the palestinians to destroy israel it's called the right of return and you know they what's so interesting right is like kill us. no like liz warren in her, in her in her speech she said that the disparity of power between Israel and the Palestinians is so enormous that you can't just leave it to the sides to settle things for themselves. And that's why the United States has to put its thumb on the scale on behalf of the Palestinians against Israel. She actually you think used she has the disparity a Palestinian of power. Ancestry that
What's you think that? She has a Pal- Do you think she has a Palestinian ancestry that we just haven't heard about? Well, you know, American Indians... Maybe she's also Fatma, not just Pocahontas. Well, no, because Pocahontas was, was, uh, was a Palestinian. Ah, now you got it. Now so then you, you have a convergence of both. And by the way, just about the, the just about the Jesus stuff, you know, I mean, one of the things that we, you know, that that I have been saying for many years is, and I actually got this from a, a colleague of mine, Al Megan, who's a, a a writer here. I'm sure you know him, uh, and he he said. I think it was at the beginning of the, of the Palestinian terror war in, in 2000 you know, that, that the, the left's uh, attacks on Israel and, you know, while we're being blown to smithereens, um, you know, they're coming to us and saying that, you know, we have to end the cycle of violence. We're not allowed to defend ourselves. You know, they're blowing up our children at discotheques and we're not allowed to defend ourselves, right? Because that it's both sides have to exercise restraint, you know, like what, what George Bush and others were saying. Um, which is immoral, and because we're being attacked, our civilians are being butchered, and this is crazy. So he said that you know this is a very Christian approach to the world, except the only Christians, as far as it's Christianity, says you have to turn the other cheek. But the only true Christians in this moral universe are the Jews, right? Everybody else has a right to self-defense. Only Israel doesn't have a right to self-defense, and if we defend ourselves, then we're immoral. And, you know, we're bad Christians, right? And so, you know, the, it, 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 this kind of, it, you know, the Europeans do it as well, but, you know, they're so cynical, but they do it too. And, and that's why they have the whole replacement theology going there. Here in the post-Christian faith that's being propounded, but, but very, you know, Christian resonating, Christianity resonating faith of the progressives. So America has to, you know, it, like you said, you know, if, 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 uh, if in, in an altercation, between a criminal and the police, a policeman kills a criminal, then then the police force has to be disarmed and everybody has to go through sensitivity training there, and the, and the police it's, it's, are the police are murderers. And in fact, you know, in her speech to the National Action Network, uh, uh, um, uh, Thomas Greenfield truly accused American cops of being bigots who kill black people. And she accused the United States of warehousing young black and brown men. I mean, what's the difference between that and uh, a co- that and communist Chinese uh, concentration camps uh, uh, for the Uyghurs? You know, she she literally accused her own country of warehousing young black and brown men, and that sounds horrific. And by the way, that also you know this is this is you're right. This is I would say that this is Obama on steroids because this is a cross government. You know, he was an ideologue. I think he's very anti-Semitic. He's very anti-American. And like you said, he's sort of suffused with this uh, it's Saidi and anti anti uh, Westernism that really you know uh, formed the basis of of his worldview and then his presidency. Um, I think he doesn't like Americans either, but he, you know, but now that view that he's spearheaded has become the whole of government position of the of the Biden administration. And when Jen Psaki was asked whether uh, by I think Newsmax. Uh, you know whether whether President Biden might be thinking about firing uh, Thomas Greenfield since she was mouthing Chinese Foreign Ministry talking points against the United States when she accused it of of being you know systemically racist and white supremacist country and saying that the American founding documents were expressions of of white supremacy. Yeah, you know, she said I think everybody agrees that uh, America has long suffered from systemic racism. In other words, she said, Oh no, everybody knows that America is evil. Right, so why are the you know that is the apology tour, but it's not just going to you know discrete countries and bowing to Erdogan and bowing to Saudi Arabia and bowing to this and bowing to that and apologizing for America and all the rest. Of it. No, this is saying, don't listen to us. We're evil. Yeah, we'll say that you know what we do to black people is nowhere near as bad as what you do to the Uyghurs, but we don't mean it because we're evil. And so even if we do mean it, we have no right to say it because we're evil. And, and this so is don't very, very. Us. This is very, very scary to the the allies of the United States because how can you trust someone who's completely lost their own confidence in their own 
moral mission. So America, you know, when I, I when I was younger, I was more critical of America than than I am now. It's not that I'm I, that I'm not critical, but my father used to say when I, I I guess I was at the end of high school or something, and he said, "Don't forget that America saved the world from the Germans twice. This is the two world wars, and 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 that was before the ending of, of the of the Cold War, and America saved Israel." Um, in, in in crucial junctions so so all all liberty loving people are horrified when America hates itself well, and I think that again you know this is um, not, not to not to beat a dead horse but this is also why it's so frustrating and horrifying to see what's happening in Israeli politics because you know I mean I wrote an article which I'm very proud of but um, you know, I, I, when, when Obama came into office, or maybe even before he came into office, when he was elected and before he was inaugurated, at any time, at any point, very early around that, in his tenure, where I called it uh, something like America and the po- Obama and the post-American world order. And, and basically what I said there was that, you know, the United States is, is about to take a leap into insanity from a governmental perspective that, you know, Obama is a radical the likes of which the United States hasn't seen in the past. He's and um, and he's going to cut off all of America's allies and what, what Israel and South Korea and Japan and Colombia and other scorned U.S. allies have to do is band together to try to survive him. Um, because uh, he's gonna he's gonna turn tail on us because he made that very clear during his during his election campaign that that's who he was his long history of associations with with uh, radical anti-American terrorists like Bill Ayers and, and Bernadine Dorn who were weatherman terrorists who and he launched his political career literally launched his political career in their living room um, they're deeply anti-Israel they had you know they. I mean, I digress, but the point is, is that his associations and his statements and, you know, his his platform when he was running was radical, was anti-Israel, was anti-American, was anti-Western, uh, and was pro-tyranny, pro-Iran, pro-American enemies, pro-cutting America down to size. And people didn't want to believe it. They didn't want to know. They wanted a black president. They thought that that would expunge the original sin of slavery from American history, and it, America would finally be able to get beyond that horrible legacy of racism. And of course, because he's anti-American, he did the exact opposite. Like you said, you know, my grandparents, their families, when they immigrated to the United States at the beginning of the 20th century, yeah, you know, they were kicked around a lot. They suffered from anti-Semitism, but mainly what they had was an opportunity to live without being without being butchered by Cossacks, you know, and, and to be able to work really, really, really hard, excruciatingly hard to the point where, you know, it's hard for us to even understand how hard they worked and the conditions that they lived in. But to make it, they made it in America, you know, they were able to send their kids to college. I mean, they, they were able to make a life for themselves and they were full of hope and they believed in America and they loved America, even when, you know, uh, they were denied jobs because they were Jewish and there was institutional anti-Semitism in the United States. So, you know, being an American and making it in America is accepting that America isn't a perfect nation. It's not a perfect union. It's a more perfect union than Tsarist Russia was. You know, it's a more it's a more perfect union than the Soviet Union, than France and Britain, than all of these countries. And now here and the European have, Union. What? Yeah, then the and European Union. The European Union. And and so now you have the situation where it's being led and again, the whole government, isn't that what they call it? The whole government, the whole of government policy, right? Is to introduce this concept that the United States is the root of all evil. So, you know, what I what I called my article that's coming out in Newsweek this week is is I think I called it something like the the Thomas the Thomas Greenfield School of uh, of Foreign Policy Doctrine, uh, the Thomas Greenfield Foreign Policy Doctrine. Because basically, you know, uh, it used to be that uh, uh, America Americans believed, you know, uh, Arthur Vandenberg, the great Republican senator who built the bipartisan coalition with Truman that enabled the United States to develop the Cold War infrastructure that guided its foreign policy for decades afterwards. You know, he said that politics end at water's edge and that the idea was that the United States would put up a united front to the world. And and it was the basis of that that would allow it to go forward and be be a superpower. And what we're seeing here is that for the for the Democrats, for the 
uh, for, for the religious, post-religious, uh, progressive uh, fanatics in, that run the Democratic Party and the Biden administration, politics is everything. Politics is foreign policy. Politics is domestic policy. There's no difference between having critical race theory in hiring policies in the federal government and, and, and using it as the basis for American foreign policy. They're both the same. And so, you know, you, you look at something like that and you see that it's this anti-Americanism is a basis for American foreign policy. And since Israel, you know, has been the whipping boy of the progressives for a long time, you know, it bodes very ill. You're right, not only for, you know, for, for, for Israel as well. And, you know, we have to think about how we deal with that situation, how the Amer God willing, the Americans will wake up the way that you and all of the rational leftists who wanted to give peace a chance woke up and, and things will change. Yeah, we there, there's an uphill fight that that we're facing, and let's hope that next time we do this show, we'll know a little more about who's going to be the government, who's going to be the prime minister, and what's going to be the government of Israel. And let's hope that it's Netanyahu, because we, we're I'm not really ready to concede him yet, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Lapid and Biden. This is I I I, I can't fall asleep when I think of that combination. All right. So only think about it in the morning. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. It was great, Caroline. Toda. All right, thanks. There's lots of fun. See you next week. See you next week.